me my wife and said, oh, uh, I, mean, I won't uh, let that stop me from asking her. <laughs> 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 mm -hmm. uh, let me follow my uh, tail. Anyway, she, uh, you can remain uh, seated and she'll get the bus. <laughs> Okay. I know the food is good, I've already <laughs> got a great mercy. Your kindness has come to us this day, and we are filled with gratitude. May the food that we take into our bodies nurture us as you have nurtured us, and may it add to that which you have already given, that we might be strong in body and mind and soul. Amen. 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 Well, like I said, uh, we were in for a real treat uh, with uh, this uh, Gail Wilk. Uh, she is a uh, master's level clinical psychologist working at the Foundation of the Mind Children and the adjustment counselor for adults who have been referred by vocational rehabilitation for a comprehensive job readiness program. She also teaches Braille, Lion Sets Childhood. She will share her story and explain the program in which she works. It's a great honor to welcome you uh, this morning. Thank you very much. Sure. They're on. They're on. <laughs> okay. You've got to take it or swallow them. All right. <laughs> um, it's an honor to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, Robert and I crossed paths at a Johnny and Chris conference in the spring and uh, got to talking and that's how it was evolved. Uh, I lost my flight when I was four years old. My family was in Chicago at that time and I conducted an unsupervised experiment uh, with, um, with an interesting looking hand that was supposed to be out of my reach up on a bone that is kind of above the oh bathroom. Oh dear. But, you know, being poor, like, so I was like a monkey, and somehow I climbed up there and got this can down. And it has the sort of lid that you can pop open with a spoon, like a nested quick can. So I did that, and I put water in it, and it bubbled up and exploded in my face. It was drain Oh, oh goodness. It's a miracle that my face wasn't scarred, other than for my cornea. My cornea was scarred by liver and the rest of my face. And it was a marvel that we happened to live in Chicago. We weren't originally from that area. We'd been there about a year, I think, at that point. And when I was ready to go to school, I went to a place called Alexander Graham Bell Elementary School. We called it Bell for short. And some of you may know Alexander Graham Bell works with deaf people uh, or something.
people in the community. So uh, I'm sure that some valiant people were still able to adapt thanks to their upbringing and their own family influences, but some people had a struggle um, with that, I am told. Does anybody have any first-hand knowledge of Jackson? In Illinois. Um, okay. Um, not sure he was talking to me, but okay. Um, let me think. Where do I want to go? So I went through grade school there, and then my family moved to Arizona, and I went to high school at Washington High, and I went to Glendale Community College for three years, and I finished my bachelor's degree at the. Uh, Oregon State University in psychology, and then I went to Southern Illinois University at Carbondale for my uh, graduate degree in clinical psych. I was in a PhD program. I did not finish the PhD, so I finished with a master's degree, but I am licensed as a psychologist in Arizona because I came here and uh, applied for what then they called certification. Um, before a PhD was required. In those days, only a master's degree was required. Within a few years, the requirement was bumped up to require a PhD, so I thought that I'd get lost in the shuffle, but I didn't. And then when they converted from certification to licensure, I thought, well, this surely will be it. But no, they sent me my license. So <laughs> I'm a licensed psychologist in Arizona. And um, I worked in community mental health in various agencies in North Phoenix for 15 years. Um, the last of those agencies, what happened was I, I applied for a job in 1977 and then I never had to apply again in all of those 18 years because agencies kept merging and, and uh, taking over one another. We kept the same client base in North Phoenix um, so the files continued, the same, uh, what we call attachment area people were being served, but in different addresses under different <coughs> names. The first thing I was hired under the Arizona Guidance Center, the last one was Tarot. Some of you may know of Tarot, it still exists. Um, it is best known for its treatment for chemical dependency, which it still does. Um, they added in a mental health component uh, in I guess it was the early 90s. So the agency I was working for at that point, which was called North Community Behavioral Health Center, uh, merged with Tero, and we did the work with people who didn't necessarily have chemical dependency issues. Worked with a lot of seriously mentally ill folks. None of my clients were white. Uh, it's, I think. <coughs> I you know, may have had some people who wore glasses, but in all those 18 years, I only had one client who had been diagnosed with a serious eye problem. And I, he wasn't referred to me specifically, but that was just happened to me. Uh, my specialty area in those days was working with people with anxiety or panic disorder, particularly agoraphobia, which is fear of being away from a safe person or place. Uh, but I also worked with people with a wide variety of other emotional distresses, particularly depression. Uh, after working in that field for 18 years, uh, I developed fibromyalgia and got to a point where I wasn't physically well enough to work full time anymore. So I resigned and uh, I tried private practice. I thought without the stress of having so many clients in a week that I, you know, recover sufficiently and be able to live off private practice. It didn't quite evolve that way. I didn't get instantly better. <laughs> um, so eventually I did apply for SSDI, Social Security Disability Income, and was on that for quite a while. <coughs> I gradually did get better physically, and I was doing all kinds of volunteer <coughs> work with a, uh, a hospice and with Camelot Therapeutic Horsemanship, which is a marvelous equestrian program for people with disabilities from age seven on up. Uh, and then I, well, I've been asked to be on various boards of directors. Um, God was steering me in the direction of where I am now. I, I, 
I now have the perfect job for um, for me, by the way. Uh, God has raised me up. When I was a little girl, my mom used to say that my blindness was my cross to bear. She didn't see men in a bad way. She meant that, you know, Christ had his cross and I had mine. And, um, so I never, I don't recall feeling bad about being blind. Uh, I was very fortunate that I lost my sight at an early enough age. I didn't have to unlearn a lot of things. I didn't have to give up driving. Um, I didn't have to give up reading print. And I had learned print block letters playing with toys earlier on, but I hadn't actually been taught to learn. So when I learned to read, I learned to read Braille. And uh, it was just relatively natural. People say, how long do you think you learned Braille? And well, I'm not sure. How long do you think you learned to learn print? <laughs> My medium, whatever your medium is, is that I believe it's comparable, really. Um, at least when you're a child, it's flexible. Um, so, um, in 1990, while I was still working for uh, Tarot, uh, a friend of mine called me and said, I've been asked to do a speaking engagement by the Governor's Council on Blindness and Disability Parents, which I've never heard of before. And my friend uh, was a probation officer, and he was totally blind, and I had met him when my family moved back here from Illinois in the year I started high school, 1963. I was in a, I think it was Denny, Glendale, with my mom. And a police officer came up and asked mom about me because he had a son at home who was born. Well, I was 13 at the time, and his son was five, and he just lost his life to a brain tumor. And he was having trouble uh, learning Braille, and I was asked, I offered to work with him, and I did that for a while. And then we were out of touch for many, many years and crossed paths somewhere along the way. Anyway, he called me up and said, hey, I, I already have a previous engagement to do, do this talk for me. Yeah, I said, I love you, and uh, that's how my career in the blindness field started in <laughs> 1990. Um, and when I was there, I met someone who is now the Director of Services for the Blind Visually Impaired in Arizona, uh, Ed House. And he asked me to this speaking engagement, that speaking engagement, one thing led to another. I was on the board of directors of the Arizona Center for Blind and Visually Impaired for a while, and I was on the board of directors of the Foundation for Blind Children for a while, and so on and so forth. Then, also, kind of concurrent with all of this, I decided I was going to try to get a talking computer. So, I bought a computer. And I thought, well, if I get a speech program for it, I'll be able to figure out how to use it. <laughs> so I scouted around and uh, connected with vocational rehabilitation, and they sponsored me to get some training, which happened to be at the Foundation for Blind Children, where I met Mark Nelson, who is blind. And um, he was my first instructor in, in technology. I had several others after him there at FPC. Well, anyway, I was still working at Tarot. And after I, a few years after I'd been on disability due to, to the fibromyalgia, I got a call out of the room one day from Mark Nelson saying, how would you like to work for FPC? Well, tell me about it. By the end of the call, I was told. Um, they had just received a grant from the state of Arizona through vocational rehabilitation to do a comprehensive program of services for adults who were both rehab clients. And the program started in 2004 at the main campus of FCC. Uh, let me back up and regroup. I know I'm just bouncing around here. If anyone has questions or wants me to explain something further or I don't do that, please just say my name. I'm Gail. Just one second, I have a quick talk here. Okay. Foundation for Blind Children was started in 1952. I'm 60 years old next year. And it was started by some parents who had some young blind children for whom there were organized services in Arizona. 
outside of Arizona schools for the deaf and blind in Tucson. <laughs> and at that time, uh, it started in Scottsdale. It has um, provided services at various physical, physical locations over the years since then. Our current primary campus is at near some uh, central, what am I saying? <laughs> I'm thinking of my favorite restaurant. No. <laughs> 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 well, it's at Northern. <laughs> it's actually a block north of Northern and a block of east of Fox Street. And SBC now owns that entire city block except for one small beauty salon. <laughs> um, so in the main building, we have our preschool for children roughly three to five. And I think we average 70 or 80 students at that location. We have eight or nine classrooms. Let's see. It's a very little bit of population. But we have eight primary classrooms, and they can have up to eight or nine students apiece. There's also, uh, in another building, uh, a primary education program which serves kids from approximately age five up until nine or ten or so. Uh, roughly equivalent to fourth grade. Now, the goal is to teach blind children the basics they need in order to be mainstreamed into their neighborhood school. However, there are some children for whom that is very difficult because they have additional disabilities. If a child has only blindness to deal with and they have reasonably good intelligence, they can learn those basic skills of blindness and be mainstreamed. And uh, when they're mainstreamed, they get support services from us through teachers of the vision and parents who are itinerant. They go from school to school to work with the children and or the children's teachers to facilitate their learning process. <coughs> if a child has started learning Braille and they need more training in Braille, that teacher is visually impaired or TBI will continue their training. If they need orientation and mobility training, which has to do with using a white cane, uh, an O&M instructor, O&M for orientation and mobility, can go out and work with them at their school or home, wherever they need <coughs> training. But we do have quite a few students who aren't able to be in the as early, if at all. So at FBC, we do have some who are only visually impaired. We also have some who have problems with uh, digestion, uh, respiratory problems, neurological problems, walking problems, you name it. If language is in the mix, they tend to come to FBC. Unfortunately, over the years, the teachers there have <coughs> learned the additional skills they need to help these children. We have a physical therapist, we have speech therapists, we have music therapists. Um, we have a volunteer <coughs> program. Someone comes in with a therapy dog once in a while to visit with the children. Uh, it's just a marvelous program. We also serve children in Chandler. There's a preschool, a CT preschool in Chandler. And also around 75th Avenue and uh, Buckeye. Our adult services are strictly at the 12th Street and Northern location. And the, well, when they come to us, they, can, they are clients for vocational rehabilitation. We don't call them clients, we call them students. And we treat our program like a cross between college classes and a job. We expect them to be functional. Um, respectful of everybody and um, if they need time off, they need to kill on uh, these requests and so on because part of the whole deal is preparing them to either go to work possibly for the first time in their lives or possibly to return to the work field <coughs> after the vision loss. Some of our students who are born with vision problems but need some extra training to be successful at work um, some have lost their sight recently. We have a wide variety of people coming to us. Now, I'm curious, do people think, let me do this as a vote, uh, say I think, whichever choice seems is your choice. Do you think there are fewer blind people these days than there used to be? Say I if you think yes. You're right. 
There are more. It's ironic, but as science has progressed, we actually have more blind People are living longer, so they're more likely to be around to develop macular degeneration. <coughs> and children who are born prematurely are more likely to survive, but they may have more uh, difficulties, both visually and with other body systems, um, than would a full-term baby. <coughs> so um, we don't lack for students. I keep thinking, there can't be this many blind adults who need training, but they keep coming, and we've got a waiting list. <laughs> um, so the program I work in has been there for seven years, and um, as I mentioned earlier, I can tell it's very crystal clear. God has been preparing me for this particular job all my life. Mm -hmm. um, I never used to really want to associate myself with blind people. I, I didn't. <laughs> um, I was an only child. I was spoiled. Um, I knew blind kids when I was in grade school because I had a homeroom which usually had four or five other blind people. Um, but I, for one, one reason, is in our homeroom, there was a, a young man who was developmentally disabled as well as blind, and he would sit in the back of our classroom and rock, and every once in a while, just out of the blue, he'd say, tires! Hmm. And I thought, he's weird. We love he's nice, but he's weird. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, he I didn't too. want people to think I was like Lenny. Which is sad, but you know how kids are. And look, I mean, so are adults, let's face it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I understand it all better now, but uh, anyway, so I, when, uh, we, when I hear about events for blind kids, I didn't want to go. And I didn't. I didn't really get involved with the blindness community till I was 40. <laughs> and then I was being invited to speak as an expert. <laughs> 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 yes, it did. Lo and behold, here I am supposedly teaching you how to do this and I'm learning from you. Um, because although I got excellent academic training at Bell School, we did not talk about blindness. We didn't talk about being blind and what it was like <coughs> and how other people treated us and <coughs> how we'd get along and how we'd ever date and all that stuff. You know, we just did our thing and didn't know how we manage all of that stuff. It's just what we talked about. Uh, my cane training, my initial cane training, was at age 12. Um, it was a residential program <coughs> for three weeks one summer, and uh, I learned the basics of how to use a white cane, learned to use a city bus. And then when I got home, the pain disappeared. I never saw it again, and I never wondered where it went. <laughs> Care less. Um, I've always had a little bit of useful vision. Mostly I see blobs of color, which is a blessing. It helps a lot, but I can't read prints, and I do run into things if I don't use my game. So. But it took a lot of years to accept that uh, when I was young. There was always, always somebody to guide me where I needed to go. Or in familiar areas, I didn't need a guide. You know, I was flying around our car apartment complex and at school. I knew my way around. We didn't use canes at my school. They didn't teach us all in them when I was, uh, until I was 12. <laughs> um, then I came to high school here. I didn't use a cane here either. Uh, somehow I managed to get through without any drastic problems. When I went to Oregon State University, uh, I lived in a dorm across a <coughs> wide street called the University <laughs> in southern Illinois. And um, one day I was crossing that street in a fairly slow moving car, side swiped me, mm -hmm. and made me sit down hard. Not consensually to me. I didn't get physically injured, but it was like, you know, I guess I ought to carry it. Sorry. I didn't really want to do that. I didn't want people to see me as different, even though I knew people could tell I didn't see me. My eyes look odd. I have scars to show over my eyes. And so I, I knew I wasn't really fooling anybody, but somehow getting that cane was just, you know, like really admitting it, and I hadn't come to terms with that. 
Um, and that wasn't my last lesson either. I won't bore you with all the details. <laughs> Over the years, there have been reinforcements, and now I use my cane everywhere, even when I'm with my husband <coughs> and, and using what we call sighted guide technique. He's leading me. I still have my cane in my other hand to guard my other side. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. No, because we need to know that. You know, otherwise we're stupid or not paying attention. Well, people think, uh, and we see this a lot with our students, especially uh, women who say their husbands won't let them take the cane to the store with them. You've got me, you don't need that. Well, um, yes, no. No, I mean, yeah, you can get by without it, but how many times has it happened to any of us? But especially if you don't see, if someone says, oh, I've got something on the other aisle. You wait right here with the card, I'll be right back. And they zip away. <laughs> and there you are standing, feeling like you're standing out like a sore thumb. Mm -hmm. They don't have a cane. People walk by. They don't know why you're just standing there looking at nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I pretend to look at something. And now I have my cane. So if they're looking, they can tell. Although that doesn't guarantee anything. <laughs> When we go to baseball games, um, people just really don't pay attention. Even if they see the cane, they don't really put two and two together. Once an usher, my, my husband was carrying our food, and I had the tickets, so I handed the tickets. I just held my hand out. They took the tickets, store and them out. They trying to hand it back to me, but I wasn't reaching in the right place. And my husband pointed to the cane, you know, hello, usher. <laughs> 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 I put the tickets in my hand. That sort of thing happens all the time. I've known of people who get buttons that say low vision. I really doubt that those are very much used. What does that mean? People don't even really know what blind means for low, low vision. And <laughs> 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 you get some people who can't shift the cane. Mm -hmm. Like me. <laughs> yes, you do. You get a lot of people who can't accept that they shouldn't be driving anymore. <laughs> that they shouldn't be driving anymore. <laughs> We've met lots of people who didn't stop driving until they had an accident. My mom was one of them. Really? Yeah. Uh, well, no, no, no. She just bumped the bumper in some city. So Frank had been telling her how you got to get up the car. And he said, well, he said, it's very great. Somebody bumped her. And he said, well, she was really good. We had a student who really had a problem with but during the day, he was a driving pretty well in Boston, and he did that for I don't know how long, and then one day he was on the freeway, and he was maybe either getting on or getting off, and it was a sunset, and all of a sudden he couldn't see, and, and he had to stop in traffic, so God's hands were on him, some of the drivers, he was in the wrong lane, and, and the other person stopped their car and got out and helped him get the car off the road. That's what the good news is. Um, I've also known of I knew somebody who had been a long distance truck driver, lost his sight to diabetes eventually, you know, went gradually. And he thereafter sometimes drove on the freeway with his wife giving him directions. <laughs> Oh, oh my God. So, you know, when you're honking at people on the road and they're not going fast enough for you, my <laughs> I always think about my the clients I used to have who had agoraphobia, who were afraid to be out away from home. You know, there's a reason people are going slow and you don't really want to upset them. What side of Chicago are you from? What side of Chicago are you from? What's Illinois, what part? Oh, what part of Illinois? Um, I grew up in Chicago. Same here. Um, I went to uh, graduate school in Carbondale. Yeah. Uh -huh. I believe it. And I did a lot of things to get an education.
1950s and 60s. In those days, Braille was more accepted, more expected. Mm -hmm. I learned Braille. There was no question of, well, I really couldn't read large print. But I think even the kids in my classrooms who were called what is now called low vision, they used to call sight saving. I don't get that to this day, but they call them sight saving. <laughs> they, would, they could read large print. And I think the idea was that they should keep using large print as long as they could to save that sight, which makes no sense. But anyway, um, in those days, Braille was easier to get it and more the expected thing. But now they're saying that only, they're saying a ridiculous number, something like one tenth of legally blind kids are learning Braille. Uh, I don't know the actual number, but it's way too low, that's for sure. The philosophy has shifted. Uh, part of the reason is they don't have enough Braille teachers, but a bigger reason probably is that people don't understand how important it is for several reasons. When tape recorders started being available, even the old reel-to-reel, -reel, they were saying, oh, well, people aren't going to need Braille anymore. Oh, yes, they are. Uh, cassettes, oh, they're not going to need, yes, they are. They're still, now computers, oh, now they definitely don't need Braille anymore. And so yeah, I, lived, I lived in a blind school. You did? Yeah. I was, see, I got 5% of sight. I spent six years in applying school, and I have not regretted it. But it, I spent more, since I cannot read Braille, I cannot read an imprint book. But if the book is recorded, I'm, I'm doing well. I can, I can sit and explain the book better than some of these sightest people. I love talking to them. And that has helped a lot. I was at the blind school in New York City, the Institute for the Blind. We had one thing that I was I'm proud of. We had called scholarship students. In other words, they came in from other countries and they would go to NYU to learn special education then have their dad turn was here, they would come into the regular classroom and take the teacher's place. Ah. And the teacher would sit in the class and grade the scholarship student, because I've had them from 22 different countries. One went to Japan, one to from Australia, and I have never regretted it. Oh, wonderful. And uh, I will get with you later. Okay. I apologize. Drive the free access here. If you did that. As regards to the what it looks like in the beginning. And that's so important, the history Indeed. of learning it and seeing. I was learning up a side for it. It should be out the okay for access to pay for those of do to give the money for 19th Avenue was the place. And when you talk about the new building over on Northern and 12th uh -huh. Street, and the talking book, and to be young and involved in that, not knowing that you're making a difference, uh -huh. but just doing what is right if this was me. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Finally, you get to see the results. <laughs> oh, I forgot to mention, I had my first services from FBC were when I was in high school. I came here from um, Chicago, and uh, I had a, a TVI, Teacher of the Visually Impaired, who came to visit me at Washington High <coughs> twice a week after my regular classes to help me maybe administer the test to me. The main, most important thing she did for me was get me whatever Braille books we could get. Not all my textbooks were available in Braille. My poor mom wound up reading those to me. But if they were available in Braille, my TBI would find them for me. 
So I had services uh, from SBC from 63 to 67, and then I forgot SBC existed until I went there for tech training, and then I was on their board of directors for a while, and now I work there. <laughs> I've come full circle myself. I too am from Chicago. Oh. So it must be something in the water we drank. <laughs> <laughs>
And I think that uh, the people who are on the receiving end, the sighted person, uh, I think it's, it's rather uh, uh, disconcerting to them. Uh, they, they sometimes they don't know that they're being spoken to. Uh, so that, that's something I, I, I miss uh, quite a bit. Uh, but uh, I've been very fortunate in having a family that was extremely supportive uh, when, during my uh, my uh, uh, my healing healing period uh, following uh, following the, uh, the uh, my departure from the uh, VA hospital. VA hospital itself and the blind rehab program was extremely helpful in developing the skills <coughs> that uh, I needed to uh, navigate and also the, the braille and the typing and the various other skills. Um, and I also had a great fortune of, of meeting my wife, who has been extremely uh, uh, helpful to me and, and supportive in, uh, in my endeavors. Uh, I do have one little uh, vignette that has a little humorous aspect to the uh, I was uh, at the VA uh, clinic, <coughs> which they were checking out my, my, uh, <coughs> my eyes, and there was a, a <coughs> young lady came in uh, to the examining room and she was looking into my eyes and she looked for a long time in my left eye, which is a plastic eye. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I wondered what in the world she was spending all that time peering into this plastic eye. And she finally said, uh, Mr. Coop, do you see well out of your left side? I told her about as well as could be expected. I'd like to mention that one of the services we have uh, at FCC is it's called Vision Rehabilitation Services, which is sort of a confusing name, but we have a low vision specialist. <coughs> That's an optometrist who's gone for extra training on working with people with low <coughs> vision. Not all optometrists have that training. And all too often, when an ophthalmologist, a primary eye doctor, can't do anything more, and they tell the person, sorry, you're, you're blind now, goodbye, have a nice life, <coughs> they don't tell them, what the next step is. But there are steps. If there is remaining vision, there are various kinds of magnifiers, CCTVs, uh, special, uh, what they call spectacle mounted telescopes, and hand well scopes, all kinds of things that can be very helpful to use residual vision. I'm behind you. Okay. You buy yours? Uh, I know that you find okay. it. I, I, I don't see you right now. I know you're there. Stay here. <laughs> 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 uh, so, uh, ours doesn't have its own name. Our doctor is Dr. Lisa Child, C-H-I-L-E-S, and she's there at the Foundation for Blind Children uh, two or three days a week. So, they have devised, they meaning the, I guess the optometrists have devised special testing you know, what you can't see is a biggie on the eye chart. Regular eye doctors usually don't have much to say to you, but um, those who have low vision training uh, have other kinds of testing they can do to find out just how much you can see from what part of the eye. Some people can only see from a corner of one eye. They can figure out uh, what, if any, lenses might help to redirect light to, from there to where it needs to get to maximize the vision left. So Gail? Yes. My mother has macular and she said that she was reading 
about some type of new technology that will gather light and focus it on the little remaining spot. Uh -huh. uh, and that would theoretically allow her even to drive again. Have you heard anything yeah, yes. like that? Yes, I have. Now, it's not a given that anyone with naturally degenerated <coughs> would qualify, but it is possible. Um, two of the students we've had in the past seven years have qualified for biopsic driving. Now, they came to us legally blind, and they still are legally blind, but they had the, just the right kind of remaining vision that they could get what are called bioptic glasses. These are glasses that are that look like regular glasses uh, uh, towards the bottom and, and towards the top on one or both sides, depending on the person's knee. There's a little telescope implanted. And that's what they would learn to shift back and forth to that for distance vision to read signs and things. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's, that's not a, <laughs> it's not a myth. It, it, now, is that, it, it, it's not approved in the United States, I'm assuming. Oh, yes, it is. It is? It is. Good heavens. It's even approved in Arizona, if you can believe that. Oh, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, and they have restrictions on their licenses. The ones I know can't drive at night, and they're happy. <coughs> that's fine by them. Uh -huh. I don't think they drive on the freeway, and that's fine by them. Um, the first, I think Virginia was the first state in which it was legal, and Arizona came not too long after. Just years. But anyway, <laughs> um, but you don't just grab your your bioptic glasses and go drive. Uh -huh. There's uh, an expensive. Uh, training procedures someone has to go through after they've been medically approved. Um, so there, there is a rain on it. Mm -hmm. Seems like you'd have to retrain your brain. You would. Yeah. Yeah. You certainly would to be able to make those quick shifts back and forth without being startled all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, there are so many things we could talk about. And, I, and there was a question over here that I never quite answered about what was hard for me. This one back here also. Okay. Um, what was hard for me when we didn't have computers when I was in college. <laughs> in my college training. <laughs> so, in order to do my library research, I had to find someone to be a reader. Now, I got help paying them from both rehab. But I had to locate them, train them how to use the library, because none of them seem to know how, <laughs> even though they weren't all students, and then teach them how to use the psychological abstract. And then we sit in a little room that they call a carol, about the size of the closet with a desk. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had my braille writer, and I would take copious notes on what they read me. I mean verbatim, because in a research paper, you have to make quotations. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so, and you never going to get back to that information again. It was then or never. So I basically transcribed a whole lot of information. And um, it wasn't fun, but it got done. Yeah. Just, uh, so you had the resources. Um, Yes. For for that day, I had, I guess, the best available. You know, I was given, uh, well, I wasn't given, but I was permitted to hire readers that book rehab would pay. Yeah. And uh, I had my braille writer and my typewriter, because I had to turn in all my assignments in typing. So... Yeah, just uh, speak up. You don't yeah, have to raise your hand. Another question. Yeah. <laughs> Say my name, because I can't see your hand. <laughs> <laughs> my name. Great. And I'm sure most of these people are aware of the shots that you can get in your eye. I've been reading three years longer than I would have been reading had I not started with the shots. And when I Back first generation. got where I was. I couldn't read, and I went, and it, what it was, I have macular and cataract, but the blood and the fluid was what was blinding me. And they give me shots. The shot is the Bastin. It's the same shot they use for colon cancer. Huh. So if I have that attitude, you can go <laughs> for a shot again. So there are shots that they do 
give her macular and her different things. Uh-huh. But he won't take the cataract off because he doesn't. I had this in off and it messed me up. So I only have one eye. <laughs> so, but anyhow, I couldn't see in the left eye. But I started <coughs> covering my right eye and just looking around the room. And now I can kind of make out images of people with this eye. And he said that came from exercising there. But anyhow, he won't take this cataract off because he's afraid it will mess me up like the other one did. And I wouldn't see at all. So I have been reading for three years now that I wouldn't have been reading. I mean, if, if they ask the ophthalmologist or whoever, about it, about the Alaskan. <coughs> Some of my family members are taking shots, and it's Lucentin, which is much more expensive. And when I started, mine was not approved. They hadn't approved it, so I paid for my shot on my own. Mm. And I said, well, how do you feel about it? He said, well, he's all for it, and what he thought it was working. He said, if it was my mother, I'd recommend it. And I thought, well, if he loves his mother, I'll go along with it. <laughs> just a way of him to get even. But, I mean, it won't be forever. But, I mean, I'm happy I've had my vision for 88 years. Wow. Congratulations. Great day. Why would even a neuro ophthalmologist say get used to your eyes? But now you said speak your body about low vision specialists. Uh, Doctor Bixman. Uh, I've had people come to me from Mayo Clinic of all places saying, "My eye doctor gave up on me. The receptionist called and said the test showed they can't do anything for me." And then you got the eye And I, I actually picked up my binoculars, which was my wife's. Uh, Father, when he passed away, I had that happen. I was moving. I'd have to look through it, and I'd have to walk to the other side of the street uh-huh. through binoculars. Uh-huh. Well, if I can see through binoculars, by George, they're going to do something about my eyes. Here, here. <laughs> and I have pushed the issues, and actually, I'm still waiting on vocational rehabilitation, but I've got CCTV coming, a portable uh, one, uh, whatever it takes for me to see. Good for you. And I want to see you afterwards because I'm still going to go back to work. I worked for 38 years, and I miss working. Mm-hmm. And I'm I think we're going to uh, close the formal aspect, but we allow people to come up and talk to you. I'd like to say two more things. Okay, sure. For those who have some vision loss but still read pretty well, who can read large print, your average library can get large print books, and they can even be mailed to you. So if you would benefit from larger books and larger prints and want to read from the library, call your library <coughs> and ask if they've got them, because they can do interlibrary loans, so even if they don't have them, they can get them. The other thing is that they have begun doing some descriptive video service uh, of movies in theaters now. So that means there's an extra soundtrack that you can hear over a special headset that tells you what the visuals are during the movie. And uh, if you're interested, come up and ask me. I have uh, one, one a uh, quick comment. Uh, it, it pertains to a resource that I have not heard it mentioned up uh, to this point. And that is the, the uh, software that's available on, uh, on computers called JAWS. And uh, this is something that, that was provided to me by the Veterans Administration. I was wondering about that. And it's, it's made quite a difference in, in my business uh, uh, operations. That's what I use too. I you, use, use Josh. you use Josh? Yeah. No. Well, that, it's, uh, that, that's uh, for, for totally blind people, that, that's a, a very it's helpful It's a screen resource. reader. It speaks what's on the screen. <coughs> okay. uh, if, you're, if you're typing, it will tell you, it will enunciate each letter, and that will enable you to make corrections. And get this, uh, Dragon dictation. Yeah. There are also special uh, uh, programs to make the print bigger, bigger than you can do it. You know, there are ways to enlarge font, but Zoom text is one type that can make it really big. Um, and you just mentioned dictation. That's for inputting to the computer.
computer to verbal. I'm, I'm not using that, but uh, that, is, that also exists. I have it on my iPhone. It, it, it reads me text messages. You can actually do voice command through back from text messages and we'll send uh, text messages back and we'll type it and send it back to me. Um, I'm ready to take throw something quick about jobs and screen readers. If you um, run an organization or have a website, you can go and check to see if it's compatible with screen readers because some websites aren't. So you can actually make changes to your website to have it be accessible. Right. So if you, for the church's website or anyone else who may be in charge of a website, that's something that you can test and find out if you have an accessible website. Good point. What's the point? Where, do you, where, where do you do that? Google it. <laughs> it's like blind accessibility test and then... Mm -hmm. Well, the name of it, yeah. its nickname is WC3, W3CAG. That's short for something. Web, whatever. But you're right. Googling is probably... <laughs> <laughs> Robert, I have a burning place. What is that? Uh -huh. What was she like? Uh -huh. What would she like to see the church do to be more accessible to people? Well, uh, if, if I'm taking them in large bulletins. That would depend on your particular congregants. You need to take a survey of the people you have and find out what would make it easier for them. Uh, and probably in large bulletins would help a lot of people, even if they're not seriously visually impaired. Um, for those of us who can't read print, if we have access to computers, if the church bulletin could be emailed to us a day or two ahead, that could be a big help. I was think I was sitting with you today and you you didn't you weren't able to do the responses and weren't able to screen. Um, is there any way that that could have been changed? Well, I have a room in Boston, so I could have if it were emailed to me with if the hymns for email, I, I could produce uh, Braille from that. Um, there, there are workarounds, there are ways to do it. Um, if you have enough notice, the um, Phoenix Public Library, the one on the Dow, can do Brailing. Um, <laughs> I think they do it at no charge, um, but they need a little forewarning. I have one. <coughs> CCTV has a uh, a camera on their machine. You could actually point at any organ in your house or whatever, your clock or whatever, and it would project the image on the screen. Now, if you had something like for the chief, like when you're doing hymns, if it was on your hymn book and you had a big screen, you could actually, so you, everybody could read the, the song, the hymn. Because your CCTV little camera, you could put it on that book and you put it up on the screen. Well, again, I'm going to suggest that <laughs> we live like a state forever, but, but we have obligations usually for the afternoon, and I have an obligation today to go. We'll <laughs> come next time. <laughs> today that some of the best caregivers are people who have overcome challenges, personal challenges themselves. Amen. And, th and I think that's what we are. We're people helping each other because we have uh, been able to overcome uh, certain challenges. So thanks for coming. We'll
have our next uh, meeting in September. And I'd like to ask uh, Representative October. 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 <laughs> October. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'd like to ask Pastor uh, Steve if he would uh, send this forth. I'd be glad to. I, I just want to say one thing. Uh, uh, Gail, thank you so much for being with us today. It's a real privilege and pleasure. Um, we had four visitors with us today who were all hearing impaired. And one of them said, in their first visit, and they were just kind of testing us out, and they said they need some help if we can do some uh, signing of the service, then they would really be able to get a whole bunch of people that would be likely to come. And, and, and what they said was, it meant so much for us to see a person up there uh, with a cane, a person uh, who was not sighted, and, and that made us feel made us feel right at home, <laughs> and, and so, uh, no, so thank right. you. I didn't want to accept the offer of wireless mic. It was, it was, it was <laughs> great. It was great. So thank you for not accepting the wireless mic. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, so uh, it is, it, it is uh, Jesus taught us that it was not just that we helped those who had, had, had uh, a handicapping issue, but that they helped us. Right. And that, wow. that we need that Je Jesus's idea is that 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 we're all in this together, and that the help goes both ways. Right. And so that's been my experience in this congregation. It's been my experience throughout my life. Uh, um, uh, some of us, some of us are in recovery from other kinds of things. You know that uh, uh, where we've been helped as well by you know by um, by those who have been there too. So it means everything, and it's. It, Thank you for all for participating in this today, and I, I ask you to go forth um, remembering um, what my old friend Harold Wilkie, who was <laughs> born without arms, and he was he was a United Church of Christ minister, and uh, he wasn't allowed to be a minister in the church in which he was raised because it said in the rubrics of that church that you couldn't be a minister if you couldn't raise the sacrament over the altar with your hand. And so, so he could do it with his foot, you know, and, and he did. But he used to say, and when he was addressing people, and he's one of the people that pushed through the Americans with Disabilities Act, you know, and he used to say, I first like to address my temporarily able-bodied yeah. friends. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, because they all get hit with something, and it's just the way it is. So, so go out into the world in peace, acknowledging that you temporarily maybe have some of what you have, but but use it all as a gift for 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 whomever, and and uh, accept the gift from from everyone because the the, the uh, people there's nobody there's nobody that God has left without a gift to share with you. Amen. Uh, yeah. Amen.